Volume One, Chapter Nine of The Day Will Come by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. Poor girl, put on thy stifling widow's weed and scape at once from hope's accursed bands. Today thou wilt not see him, nor tomorrow, and the next day will be a day of sorrow life falls back into old grooves after calamities the most stupendous after fires after plagues after earthquakes people breakfast and dine marry and are given in marriage a few more graves testify to the fever that has decimated a city a ruined village here and there along the smiling southern shore shells that were once houses churches beneath whose shivered domes no worshipper dare ever kneel again bear witness to the earthquake but the monotonous commonplace life goes on all the same in city and village on hill and seashore and so when godfrey carmichael was laid in his grave when the coroner had adjourned and again adjourned his inquiry and an open verdict had been pronounced life in cheriton house resumed its old order and the room in which the bridegroom had lain murdered at the feet of the bride was again thrown open to the sun and air and to the sound of voices and to the going and coming of daily life lady cheriton would have had the room closed for a year at least she pleaded but her husband told her that to make it a sealed chamber now would be to throw it out of use for his lifetime if we once let servants and people think and talk of it as a haunted room nobody will ever like to occupy it again so long as this house stands he said stories will be invented those things shape themselves unawares in the human mind sounds will be heard and the whole house will become uninhabitable we both love our house maria our own hands have fashioned it after our own hearts it would be folly to put a brand upon it and to say henceforward it shall be a curse to us god knows i am sorry for juanita's sorrow sorry for my own loss but i look to you to help me in keeping our home bright and pleasant for our declining days it was the habit of her life to obey him and try to please him in all things so she answered gently of course dear james it will be as you wish i feel sure you are right it would be wicked to shut up that lovely room with a faint shudder but i shall never go near the west window without thinking of our dear boy and i'm afraid juanita will never be able to endure the room perhaps not we can use the other rooms when she is here she has her own house now and i dare say it will be some time before she will care to cross this threshold the house must seem fatal to her it was her own caprice that brought him here i'm afraid that recollection will torture her poor child it was finally decided therefore that the drawing-room should be used nightly as it had been all the peaceful years that were gone the lamps with their gay shades of rose or amber made spots of coloured light amidst tables heaped with flowers all the choicest blooms that the hot-houses or the gardens could produce were brought as of old like offerings to a pagan shrine the numberless toys upon the tables were set out in the old orderly disorder porcelain and enamel bonbon boxes on one table antique watches in gold and silver snuff boxes on another bronzes intaglios coins medals filigree scent bottles upon a third and a background of flowers everywhere the piano was opened and the candles lighted ready for her ladyship who sang spanish ballads delightfully even yet and who was in the habit of singing to her husband of an evening whenever they were alone they were generally alone now not being able to receive visitors from the outside world at such a time the vicar of the parish dined at cheriton now and then and matthew dalbrook spent a night there occasionally and talked over business matters and the future development of a tract of land at swanage which formed a portion of the original strangway estate the widow had taken possession of her new home the home which they two were to have lived in for half a century of loving union they had joked about their golden wedding as they sat at lunch on the lawn that day had laughed at the thought of how they would look in white hair and wrinkles and then had sighed at the thought of how those they loved now would be gone before that day came and how the friends who gathered round them would be new friends the casual acquaintances of the passing years promoted to friendship in the place of those earlier nearer dearer friends whom death had taken they had talked of their silver wedding which seemed a happier idea for dear lady jane and juanita's mother and father might all live to see that day they would be old of course older by five-and-twenty years but not too old to be happy and beloved the young wife and husband pictured the lawn on which they were sitting crowded with friends and tenants and villagers and children and planned the feasting and the sports which were to have a touch of originality something out of the beaten track which something was not easy to devise 
and now she and lady jane were sitting in the same spot in the sultry august evening two desolate women the tawny giant at their feet his dog the mastiff styx looking up at them now and then with great serious eyes as if asking what had become of his master juanita was strangely altered since the day of her honeymoon her cheeks had hollowed and the large dark eyes looked larger and gave a haggard expression to the pallid face but she was bearing her sorrow bravely for lady jane's sake as lady jane had done for her sake in the beginning of things that gentle lady had broken down after the funeral and juanita had been constrained to forget her own agony for a brief space in trying to comfort the bereaved mother and so the two acted and reacted upon each other and it was well for them to be together they had settled down in the old house before they had been there a week lady jane put off her return to swanage indefinitely she could drive over now and then to supervise the gardening and she would stay at the priory as long as juanita wanted her that would be always said juanita ah my love that would not do i don't forget all that has been written about mothers-in-law there must be some truth in it oh but you forget that is when there is son and husband to quarrel about said juanita with a sudden sob we have no cause for jealousy we have only our dead lady jane wanted to establish her daughter-in-law in that cheerful sitting-room which had been her own but here juanita opposed her i am not going to have it now she said resolutely it shall be your room always no one else shall use it i am going to have his room for my den my dearest it is the dullest room in the house it was his room and i like it better than any other in the world she arranged all her own books and possessions in the large room looking into the stable-yard which had been sir godfrey's study from the time he went to eton she found all his eton books on a lower shelf of one of the bookcases and she sat on the floor for an hour dusting grammars and dictionary first greek reader latin gratis and all the rest of them she found his college books with the college arms upon them on another shelf she would have nothing disturbed or altered and she was supremely indifferent to the questions of incongruity her own bookcases from cheriton the dainty toy bookcases of inlaid satin wood were squeezed into the recesses on each side of the fireplace her photographs of mother father friends horses and dogs were arranged upon the carved oak mantelpiece above the quaint little cupboards with carved doors spoil of old belgian churches still full of choice cigars the young man's store his spurs and hunting crops canes and boxing gloves decorated the panel between the two tall windows his despatch box still stood upon the library table and the dog's ticks pushed the door open whenever it was left ajar and strolled into the room as by old established right she felt herself nearer her dead husband here than anywhere else nearer even than in the churchyard where she and lady jane went every afternoon with fresh flowers for his grave they had not laid him in the family vault but among the graves of gentle and simple under the sunny turf the marble was not yet carven which was to mark out his grave amidst those humbler resting-places theodore dalbrook had not seen his cousin since the day of the funeral his father and his two sisters had called upon her at the priory and had brought back an account of the quiet dignity with which she bore herself in her melancholy position i did not think she had so much solid sense said janet and then she and sophia talked about the priory as a dwelling-house and of its inferiority to cheriton and speculated upon the amount of their cousin's income she has a splendid position she will be a fine catch for some one by and by said harrington i hope she won't go and throw herself away upon an adventurer i hope not said his father but i suppose she will marry again that seems inevitable i don't see that it is inevitable argued theodore almost angrily she was devotedly attached to her husband i suppose there is now and then a woman who can remain faithful to her first love when the first love is alive and not always then put in sophia flippantly of course she will marry again if she wanted to remain single people would not let her with her income theodore got up and walked to the window his sister's talk often set his teeth on edge but rarely so much as it did to-day you talk of her as if she were the most shallow-brained of women he exclaimed with his back to the family group looking out with gloomy eyes into the old-fashioned street the narrow circumscribed view which he had hated of late with a deadly hatred i don't think she is very deep answered sophia she never could appreciate darwin she told me once that she wondered what i could find to interest me in earthworms 
a woman must indeed be shallow who feels no interest in that thrilling subject sneered theodore upon my word now said his father darwin's book interested me though i'm not a scientific man and i never see a worm wriggling off the gardener's spade without feeling that i ought to be grateful to him as a factor in the landed interest perhaps continued mr dalbrook musingly my own practice in the conveyance line owes something of its substantial character to earthworms if it were not for them there might be no land to convey the conversation drifted lightly away from juanita and her sorrow but her image still filled theodore's mind and he left the drawing-room and the frivolous talk and the clinking of teacups and teaspoons and went out in the declining light to walk in the avenue of sycamores on the edge of the old city he had not called upon his cousin in her new home he shrank from the very idea of meeting her while her sorrow was still new while her thoughts and feelings were concentrated upon that one subject while he could only be to her as an unwelcome intruder from that outside world she loathed as grief loathes all but its own sad memories had the calamity which had desolated her life brought her any nearer to him who had loved her so long and so unselfishly alas no he told himself that if she ever loved again it would be to a stranger that her reawakening heart would open rather than to the rejected lover of the past the man whom her memory would couple with the husband she had lost and whom she would compare disadvantageously with that chosen one no he told himself there was little more chance for him in the future than there had been in the past she liked him and trusted him with a sisterly affection which nothing short of a miracle could warm into love passion does not grow out of such placid beginnings in her very dawn of girlhood she had been in love with godfrey had blushed at his coming had quarrelled with him and wept stormy tears had suffered all those alternations of joy and grief pride and self-abasement which accompany love in an impassioned nature theodore remembered her treatment of the fifth form etonian of the undergraduate remembered the passionate drama perpetually being acted in those two young lives a drama which he had watched with aching heart and he felt that he could never be as that first lover had been he was associated with the commonplace of her life she had laughed often at his dry-as-dust talk with her father the dull discussions about leases and bills of dilapidation a solicitor living from year's end to year's end in a country town what a dreary person he must needs appear beside the brilliant young patrician full of the gladness of the life that knows neither labour nor care he sickened at the thought of that contrast he had served his father faithfully hitherto and the bond between father and son had been one of strong affection as well as duty but for the last year there had been growing upon him an inexpressible weariness of the house in which he was born and the city in which he had lived the chief part of his uneventful life he had struggled against the disgust of familiar things telling himself that it was an unworthy feeling and that he would be a snob if he indulged it yet the disgust grew into absolute loathing the monotonous days the repetitive work oppressed him like a nightmare since juanita's marriage the burden had become more and more intolerable to be so near her yet so far to be letting life creep away in dull drudgery which could never bring him nearer her social level to feel that all his pursuits and associations were beneath the woman he loved and could never arouse the faintest interest in her mind this was almost too bitter to be borne and he had for some time past been meditating some way of escape some manner of release from these old fetters into the wider arena of the outer world such escape was not easy he had to think of his father that indulgent large-minded father who had given his son a very remunerative share in his practice at an age when most young men are dependent for every suit of clothes or a five-pound note upon parental bounty and parental caprice he knew that his father looked to him for an entire release from work before they were many years older and that he would then find himself sole master of a business worth at least fifteen hundred a year all this had come to him and would come to him easily as the reward of conscientious and intelligent work it was a prospect which few young men would forego without considerable hesitation but theodore hardly thought of the substantial advantages which he was so eager to sacrifice his sole hesitation was on account of the disappointment which the step he contemplated would inflict upon his father he was not without a foreshadowing of a plan by which that disappointment might be in some wise lessened he had kept an eye upon his brother for some time past and he had discovered that the young man's fervour for the anglican church had begun to cool there were all the signs of wavering in that gifted youth 
at one time he devoted all his study to the writings of cardinal newman hurl frude and the tractarian party he lived in the atmosphere of oxford in the forties he talked of cardinal manning as the head and front of religious thought he was on the verge of deciding for the old faith then a sudden change came over the spirit of his dream he began to have doubts not of the reformed faith but of every western creed light comes from the east he told his sisters with an oracular air i doubt if there is any nearer resting-place for the sole of my foot than the temple of buddha i find the larger creed for which my mind yearns boundless vistas behind and before me i begin to entertain painful doubts of my fitness for the anglican church i might be a power perhaps but it would be outside those narrow bounds like voysey or stopford brook the church with its present limitations would not hold me the sisters sympathized argued quoted essays and reviews and talked of darwin and spencer huxley and comte theodore listened and said nothing he saw which way the tide was turning and rejoiced in the change of the current and now this sultry august afternoon pacing up and down the green walk he was expectant of an opportunity of discussing his brother's future with that gentleman himself as harrington was in the habit of taking his afternoon constitutional book in hand upon this very path he appeared by and by carrying an open volume of max muller and looking at the nursemaids and perambulators what theo taking your meditative cigar you don't often give yourself a holiday before dinner no but i wanted to talk to you alone and i knew this was your beat nothing gone wrong i hope no it is your future i want to discuss if you don't mind my future is wrapped in a cloud of doubt replied the younger man dreamily were the church differently constituted were the minds that rule in it of a larger caste a wider grasp a eh? harrington how would you like the law as a profession theodore asked abruptly when the other began to hesitate my dear fellow it is all very well to ask me that question when you know there is no room for me in my father's office retorted harrington with a contemptuous wave of that long lean white hand which always reminded him of st francis de sales or savonarola not that he had any positive knowledge of what those saintly hands were like room might be made for you said theodore i should not care to accept a subordinate position oh caesar so far as the caesarship of a provincial solicitor's office can go the whole empire may be yours by and by if you like provided you put your shoulder to the wheel and pass your examinations do you mean to say that you would throw up your position and an income which would allow of your marrying to-morrow if you chose to make room for me if i can get my father's consent yes decidedly and how do you propose to exist without a profession i don't propose anything of the kind i mean to go to the bar oh i begin to understand a solicitor's office is not good enough for you i don't say that but i have taken a disgust an unreasonable disgust no doubt to that branch of the law and i am very sick of dorchester so am i retorted harrington gazing vaguely at a pretty nursemaid we are agreed there at any rate and you want to follow in lord cheriton's track and make a great name it is only one man in a thousand who succeeds as james dalbrook has succeeded but if i go to the bar you may be sure i shall do my best to get on and i shall start with a pretty good knowledge of common law you want to be in london you are pining for an aesthetic centre sighed harrington i don't quite know what that is but i should prefer london to dorchester so should i and you want me to take your place at the mill to grind out my soul in the dull round that has sickened you the life has begun to pall upon me but i think it ought to suit you answered theodore thoughtfully you are fonder of home and of the sisters than i am you get on better with them you have been rather grumpy lately i admit said harrington and you have let yourself cool upon your divinity exam you evidently don't mean the church i have outgrown the church you can't put a quart of wine into a pint bottle and you must do something i don't think you can do anything so good as to take my place and become my father's right hand until he chooses to retire and leave you the practice you will have married by that time perhaps and will have sobered down intellectually morally you are one of the steadiest fellows i know i suppose i ought to consider this what the house agents call an unusual opportunity said harrington but you must give me time to think it over take time answered theodore briefly i'll talk to my father in the meanwhile 
mr dalbrook received his elder son's communication as if it had been a blow from an enemy's hand do you suppose that ass harrington can ever take your place he exclaimed whereupon theodore took pains to explain that his brother was by no means an ass and that he was only labouring under that burden of small affectations which weighs down a young man who has been allowed to live too much in the society of young women sisters and sisters friends and to consider all his own utterances oracular he is not so fit for the church as brown is said theodore and he will only addle his brain if he reads any more theology he won't be content with Pauli and butler and the good old books which have been the turnpike road to ordination for a century he is all for new ideas and the new ideas are too big for him but if you will give him his articles and teach him as you taught me i don't think i taught you much you seem to get at everything by instinct ah you taught me my profession without knowing it and you will teach harrington with just as little trouble he will shake off that husk of affectation in your office no solicitor can be affected and he will come out a good lawyer while i am trying my luck in temple chambers reading and waiting for briefs with your help by and by i'm bound to do something i shall get a case or two upon this circuit anyhow i can't think what has put this folly in your head theo said his father with a vexed air it is not folly father it is not a caprice the young man protested with sudden earnestness for god's sake don't think me ungrateful or that i would unwillingly turn my back upon my duty to you only young people have troubles of their own don't you know and of late i have not been altogether happy i have not prospered in my love dream and so i have set up a new idol that idol so many men worship with more or less reward success i want to spread my wings and see if they will carry me on a longer flight than i have taken yet well it would be selfish of me to balk you even if your loss were to cripple me altogether and it won't do that i am strong enough to work on for a few years longer than i intended oh my dear father i hope it won't come to that i hope my change of plan won't shorten your years of leisure i am afraid that's inevitable theo i can't transfer a fine practice to my son till i've made him a good lawyer and god knows how long that will take in harrington's case judging by my present estimation of him i should say half a century but don't be downhearted theo you shall eat your dinners you shall qualify for the woolsack after all i don't know how a life of leisure might suit me it would be a change from the known to the unknown almost as stupendous as the change from life to death perhaps matthew dalbrook had fathomed that secret woe at which theodore had hinted darkly in any case he took his elder son defection more easily than might have been hoped and bore patiently with some preliminary fatuity from the younger son who accepted the gift of his articles an allowance of two hundred pounds per annum and the promise of a junior partnership in the near future with the languid politeness of one who felt that he was renouncing a mitre everything was settled off-hand and theodore was to go to london at the end of september to select and furnish his modest chambers in one of those grave old courts of the temple and be ready to begin his new life with the beginning of term he had not seen juanita since the funeral and she had been told nothing of this sudden reconstruction of his life but he determined to see her before he left dorchester and he considered that he had a right as her kinsman to bid her good-bye perhaps in his heart weariness he was inclined to exaggerate the solemnity of that leave-taking somewhat as if he had been starting for australia he drove over to the priory on a dull grey afternoon his last day in dorchester his portmanteaus were packed and all things were ready for an early departure next morning sorely as he had sickened of the good old town which was his birthplace he felt a shade of melancholy at the idea of cutting himself adrift altogether from that quiet haven and the love of those open stretches of barren heath and those swampy meadows and grazing cattle on the way to millbrook was ingrained in him deeper than he knew it was a landscape which took a peculiar charm from the grey dimness of an autumnal atmosphere and it seemed to theodore dalbrook that those level pastures and winding waters had never looked fairer than they looked to-day he had written to his cousin a day before to tell her of his intended visit it was too solemn a matter in his own mind for him to leave the finding her at home to chance his groom took the dog-cart round to the stables while he was ushered at once to the drawing-room where lady carmichael was sitting at her work-table in the bow-window with sticks stretched on a lion-skin at her feet the silence of the house struck theodore dalbrook painfully as he followed the footman across the hall and along a corridor which led to the drawing-room that death-like silence of a roomy old mansion in which there are neither children nor guests 
only one lonely inhabitant waited upon by solemn-visaged servants drilled to a phenomenal quietness and keeping all their good spirits for the remoteness of the servants hall shut off by double doors and long passages saddened by that atmosphere of gloom he entered his cousin's presence and stood with her small cold hand in his looking at the face which had changed so sorely from that vivid beauty which had shone upon him in the low light of the sinking sun on that summer evening not three months ago as he looked the memory of the bride's face came between him and the face of the widow and for a moment or two he stood speechless the clearly cut features were pinched and sharpened wasted by long nights of weeping and long days of silent regret the dark eyes were circled by purple shadows and the oval cheeks were sunken and pallid all the colour and richness of that southern beauty had vanished as if some withering blight had passed over the face it was very good of you to think of me before you left dorchester she said gently she pushed forward a chair for her cousin before she sat down and theodore seated himself opposite to her with the wicker work-table between them he wondered a little to see that satin-lined receptacle gorged with bright-coloured silks and pieces of unfinished embroidery for it seemed to him that there was a touch of frivolity in this light ornamental needlework which hardly harmonised with her grief-stricken countenance you cannot suppose that i should leave without seeing you he said i should have come here weeks ago only only you wanted to give me time to grow calm to teach myself to look my trouble straight in the face she said interpreting his thought that was very thoughtful of you well the storm is over now i am quite calm as you see i dare say some people think i am getting over it that is the usual phrase is it not and so you are going to the bar theodore i am glad of that you are clever enough to make a name as my father did it will be slow work i suppose but it will be a field worthy of your ambition which a solicitor's office in a market town never would be i have felt the want of a wider field for a long time and i shall feel more interest in a barrister's work but i hope you don't think i am conceited enough to expect to get on as well as your father i don't know about that i think you must know you are a clever man i have been wishing to see you for a long time theodore only i was like you i wanted to give myself time to be calm i want to talk to you about the murderer yes have you heard anything has there been any discovery nothing the offer of a reward has resulted in nothing not one little scrap of information the london detective gave up the business and went back to town a week after the funeral having obtained only negative results the police hereabouts are creatures without an idea and so unless something is done unless some clever brain can solve the riddle the wretch who killed my husband may go down to the grave unpunished it is hard that it should be so said theodore quietly yet it is an almost impossible case there is not a single indication so far to put one on the track not one little clue not for these dull-brained mechanical discoverers perhaps but for you or me theo for us who loved him there ought to be light think what a strange murder it was not for gain remember had it been the hand of a burglar that shot him i could understand the difficulty of tracing that particular criminal among all the criminal classes but this murder which seems utterly motiveless must have been prompted by some extraordinary motive it was not the act of a maniac a maniac must have left some trace of his presence in the neighbourhood a maniac could not have so completely eluded the police on the alert to hunt him down there must have been some indication put madness out of the question juanita what then hatred theodore that is the strongest passion in the human mind a savage hatred which could not be satisfied except with the brightest life that it had the power to destroy a relentless hatred not against him not against my beloved what had he done in all his good life that any one upon this earth should hate him but against us against my father and mother and me the usurpers the owners of cheriton manor against us who have thrust ourselves upon the soil which that wicked race held so long oh theodore i have thought and thought of this till the conviction has grown into my mind till it has seemed like a revelation from god it was one of that wicked family who struck this blow one of your predecessors the strangways is that what you mean nita yes that is what i mean my dear juanita it is too wild an idea what after your father has owned the estate nearly a quarter of a century 
why should the enemy wait all those years and choose such a time because there never before was such an opportunity of striking a blow that should bring ruin upon us my father's hope of making his son-in-law his successor in the peerage was known to a good many people it may easily have reached the ears of the strangways my dear girl the family has died off like rotten sheep i doubt if there are any survivors of the old race oh but families are not obliterated so easily there is always some one left there were two sons and a daughter of the old squires surely one of those must have left children but juanita to suppose that any man could hate the purchaser of his squandered estate with a hatred malignant enough for murder is to imagine humanity akin to devils we are akin to devils cried juanita excitedly i felt that i could rejoice as the devils rejoice at human suffering if i could see my husband's murderer tortured yes if he were tied against a tree as indian savages tie their sacrificial victims tied against a tree and killed by inches with every variety of torture which a hellish ingenuity can suggest i would say my litany like those savages my litany of triumph and content yes theodore we have more in common with the devils than you may think i cannot see the possibility of murder prompted by such an inadequate motive said theodore slowly remembering as he spoke how churton had suggested that the crime looked like a vendetta inadequate ah that depends don't you see remember we have not to deal with good people the strangways were always an evil race almost every tradition that remains about their lives is a story of wrongdoing and think how small a wound may be deadly when the blood has poison in it beforehand and it is a small thing to see strangers in a home that has been in one's family for three centuries again remember that although nothing throve on the cheriton estate while the strangways held it or at any rate not the last hundred years of their holding no sooner was my father in possession than the luck changed quarries were developed land that had been worthless became valuable for building everything has prospered with him and think of them outside banished for ever like adam and eve out of paradise think of them with hate and envy gnawing at their hearts there would be time for them to get over that feeling in four-and-twenty years and when you talk about them i should like to know exactly whom you mean i assure you the general idea is that they have all died off that is to say all of the direct line it is upon that very subject i want to talk to you theodore would you like to do me a service a very great service nothing would make me happier then will you try to find out all about the strangways if they are really all gone or if there are not some survivors or a survivor of the last squire's family if you can do that much it will be something gained we shall know better what to think when i heard that you were going to live in london it flashed into my mind that you would be just the right person to help me and i knew how good you had been to me always and that you would help london is the place in which to make your inquiries i have heard my father say that all broken lives all doubtful characters gravitate towards london it is the one place where people fancy they can hide i will do everything in my power to realize your wish juanita i shall be a solitary man with a good deal of leisure so i ought to succeed if success be possible they were silent for some few minutes juanita being exhausted with the passionate vehemence of her speech she took up a piece of embroidery from the basket and began with slow careful stitches upon the petal of a dog-rose i am glad to see you engaged upon that artistic embroidery said theodore presently for the sake of saying something that means perhaps that you wonder i can care for such frivolous work as this she said interpreting his recent thought when his eyes first lighted on her satin-lined basket with its rainbow-hued silks it seems inconsistent i dare say but this work has helped me to quiet my brain many a time when i have felt myself on the brink of madness these slow regular stitches the mechanical movement of my hand as the flowers grow gradually stitch by stitch through the long melancholy day have quieted my nerves i cannot read books give me no comfort for my eyes follow the page while my mind is brooding on my own troubles it is better to sit and think quietly while i work it is better to face my sorrow have you been long alone no it is only three weeks since lady jane went back to swanage and she comes to see me two or three times a week my father and mother come as often you must not think i am deserted every one is very good to me they have need to be again there was a brief interval of silence and then juanita closed her basket and lifted her earnest eyes to her cousin's face 
you know all about the strangways she inquired i have heard a good deal about them from one and another people who live in the country have long memories and are fond of talking of the lords of the soil even when the race has vanished from the land i have heard elderly men tell their after-dinner stories about the strangways at my father's table you know the family portraits at cheriton the pictures in the hall yes i have wondered sometimes that your father should have kept them there effigies of an alien race i hate them exclaimed juanita shuddering i always had an uncomfortable feeling about them a feeling of strange cold eyes looking at us in secret enmity but now i abhor them there is a girl's face a cruel face that i used rather to admire when i was a child and sometimes dream about and on the last night but one of my happy life i looked at that picture with godfrey and told him my feeling about that face and he told me the pitiful story of the girl whose portrait we were looking at the creature had a sad life and died in france poor and broken-hearted two hours later i heard a strange step upon the terrace while godfrey and i were sitting in the library a stealthy creeping step coming near one of the open windows and then creeping away again when we looked out there was no one to be seen and this was the night before sir godfrey's death yes i told my father about it after after my trouble and when he questioned the gardeners he discovered that footprints had been seen by one of them on the damp gravel the morning after i heard that ghost-like step they were strange footprints the man was sure or he would not have noticed them the prints of a shoe with a flat heel not of a large foot but they were not very distinct and he went over them with his roller and rolled them out and thought no more about the fact till my father questioned him the next day was dry and warm as you know and the gravel was hard next night there were no footprints seen afterwards did the gardener trace those marks beyond the terrace to the avenue for instance not he all he did was to roll them out with his iron roller they suggest one point that the murderer may have been lurking about on the night before the crime i am sure of it that footstep would not have frightened me if there had been no meaning in it i felt as a scotchman does when he has seen the shadow of the shroud round his friend's figure it is a point for you to remember theodore if you mean to help me i do mean to help you god bless you for that promise she cried giving him her hand and if you want any further information about the strangways there is some one here who might be useful godfrey's old bailiff jasper blake lived over ten years at cheriton he only left there when the squire died and he almost immediately entered the service of godfrey's father if you can stay till the evening i will send for him and you can ask him as many questions as you like i will stay there is a moon rather late in the evening and i shall be able to get back any time before midnight but juanita as an honest man i am bound to tell you that i believe you are following an ignis fatuus you are influenced by prejudices and fancies rather than by reason End of chapter nine volume one chapter ten of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter x the snow of her sweet coldness hath extinguished quite the fire that but even now began to flame theodore dalbrook a sensible hard-headed man of business was like a puppet in his cousin's hands she told him to toil for her and he deemed himself privileged to be allowed so to labour she put him upon that which according to his own conviction was an absolutely false track and he was compelled to follow it she bade him think with her thoughts and he bent his mind to hers yes she was right perhaps it was a vendetta lord cheriton had lived all these years hemmed round with unseen unsuspected foes they had not burned his ricks or tried to burn his dwelling-house they had not slandered him to the neighbourhood in anonymous letters they had not poisoned his dogs or his pheasants such petty malevolence had been too insignificant for them but they had waited till his fortunes had reached their apogee till his only child had grown from bud to flower and he had wedded her to an estimable young man of patrician lineage and irreproachable character and just when fate was fairest the cowardly blow had been struck a blow that blighted one young life and darkened those two other lives sloping towards the grave the lives of father and mother rendered desolate because of their daughter's desolation mastered by that will which was his law the will of the woman he loved 
theodore began to believe as she believed or at least to think it just possible that there might be amongst the remnant of the strangway race a man so lost and perverted so soured by poverty so envenomed by disgraces and mortifications eating slowly into the angry heart like rust into iron that he had become at last the very incarnation of malignity hating the man who had prospered while he had failed hating the owner of his people's forfeited estate as if that owner had robbed them of it hating with so passionate a malevolence that nothing less than murder could appease his wrath yes there might be such a man in the history of mankind there have been such crimes they are not common in england happily but among the celtic nations they are not uncommon my first brief mused theodore with a grim smile as he walked up and down the drawing-room while his cousin was writing a memorandum requesting the bailiff's presence it is more like a case entrusted to a detective than submitted to counsel's opinion but it will serve to occupy my mind while i am eating my dinners my poor juanita will her loss seem less i wonder when she has discovered the hand that widowed her he dined with his cousin at a small round table in the spacious dining-room which had held so many cheerful gatherings in the years that were gone the sisters and their husbands and the sisters friends and godfrey's college friends and those old friends of the neighbourhood who seemed only a little less than kindred by reason of his having known them all his life and now these two were sitting here alone and the corners of the room were full of shadows one large circular lamp suspended over the table was the only light the carving being done in a serving-room adjoining juanita was too hospitable to allow the meal to be silent or gloomy she put aside the burden of her grief and talked to her cousin of his family and of his own prospects and she seemed warmly interested in his future success it was but a sisterly interest he knew frankly expressed as a sister's might have been yet it was sweet to him nevertheless and he talked freely of his plans and hopes i felt stifled in that old street he told her a man must be very happy to endure life in a country town but you are not unhappy theodore she interrupted wonderingly unhappy no that would be too much to say perhaps you know how fond i am of my father i was glad to work with him and to feel that i was useful to him but that feeling was not enough to reconcile me to the monotony of my days a man who has home ties a wife and children may be satisfied in that narrow circle but for a young man with his life before him it is no better than a prison i understand said juanita eagerly i can fully sympathize with you i am very glad you are ambitious theodore a man is worthless who is without ambition and now tell me what you will do when you go to london how will you begin i shall put up at the ends of court hotel for a few days while i look about for a suitable set of chambers and when i have found them and furnished them and brought my books and belongings from dorchester i shall sit down and read law i can read while i am qualifying for the bar i shall go on reading after i have qualified my life will be to sit in chambers and read law books until someone brings me business it hardly sounds like a brilliant career does it all beginnings are hard she answered gently i suppose my father went through just the same kind of drudgery when he began well yes he must have gone upon the same lines i fancy there is no royal road and while you are studying law and waiting for briefs will you have time to look after my interests yes juanita your interest shall be my first thought always if it can make you happier to discover your husband's murderer happier it is the only thing that can reconcile me to the burden of living if it is for your happiness you need not fear that i shall ever relax in my endeavours i may fail indeed i fear i must fail but it shall not be for the lack of earnestness or perseverance i knew that you would help me she said fervently holding out her hand to him across the table dinner was over and they were alone with the grapes and peaches of the priory hothouses which were not even second to those of cheriton unheeded upon the table before them blake is in the house by this time i dare say said juanita presently would you like to see him here and shall i stay or would you rather talk to him alone i had better take him in hand alone it is always hard work to get straight answers out of that sort of man and any cross current distracts him his thoughts are always ready to go off at a tangent he knows all about the squire's children he can give you any particulars you want about them the butler came into the room five minutes afterwards with the coffee and announced the bailiff's arrival juanita rose at once and left her cousin to receive jasper blake alone he came into the room with rather a sheepish air 
he was about sixty young looking for his age with a bald forehead and stubbly iron-grey hair and a little bit of whisker on each sunburnt cheek he had the horsey look still though he had long ceased to have anything to do with horses beyond buying and selling cart-horses for the home farm and occasionally exhibiting a prize animal in that line he was a useful servant and a thoroughly honest man of the old-fashioned order mr blake i want you to give me some information about old friends of yours i have a little business in hand which indirectly concerns the strangway family and i want to be quite clear in my own mind as to how many are left of them and where they are to be found the bailiff rubbed one of his stunted whiskers meditatively and shook his head there was never many of em to leave sir he said grumpily and i don't believe there's any of em left anywheres there seems to have been a curse upon em for the last hundred years nothing ever throve with them look at what cheriton is now and what it was in their time i didn't know it in their time mr blake ah you're not old enough but your father knew the place he did business for the old squire till things got too bad mortgages and accommodation bills and overdrawn accounts at the bank and such like and your father washed his hands of the business a long-headed gentleman your father he can tell you what cheriton was like in the squire's time why do you suppose the strangways are all dead and gone well sir first and foremost it's fifteen years and more since i've heard of any of em and the last i heard was almost as bad as bad could be what was the last report it was about master reginald that was the eldest son him that was colonel of a lancer regiment and married lord dangerfield's youngest daughter i remember the bonfires on the hills out by studlands just as if it happened yesterday but it's more than forty years ago and i was a boy in the stables at fourteen shillings a week reginald the elder son colonel of lancers married lord dangerfield's daughter about eighteen ten wrote theodore in a pocket-book which he held ready for taking notes what was it you heard about him he asked well sir it was mr de lacy's servant that told me he'd been somewhere in the south with his master where there was gambling a place where the folks made a regular trade of it it's a wonderful climate says mr de lacy's man and the gentry go there for their health and very often finish by shooting themselves and it seems colonel strangway was there he'd come over from corsica which it seems was in the neighbourhood where he'd left his poor wife all among brigands and savages and he was at the tables day and night and he had a wonderful run of luck so that they called him the king of the place and it was who but he howsoever the tide turned suddenly and he began losing and he lost his last sixpence in a manner of speaking regular cleaned out mr de lacy's man said and by and by there comes another gentleman a jewish gentleman from paris rolling in money and playing for the sake of the science and able to hold out where another man must have given in and in a week or two he was the king of the place and the colonel was nowhere just living on tick at the hotel and borrowing a fiver from mr de lacy or any other old acquaintance whenever he had the chance and making as much play as he could with two or three cartwheels where he used to play with hundred franc pieces and so it went on and he cut up uncommon rough when anybody happened to offend him and there was more than one row at the hotel or in the gardens they don't allow no rows in the gambling rooms and just as the season was coming to an end the colonel went off one afternoon to catch the boat for corsica the boat was to start after dark from nice and there was a lot of traffic in the port but not as much light as there ought to have been and the colonel missed his footing in going from the quay to the boat and went to the bottom like a plummet some people thought he made away with himself on purpose and that the one sensible thing he did was to make it look like an accident so as not to vitiate the insurance on his life which lord dangerfield had taken care of and had paid the premiums ever since the colonel began to go to the bad anyhow he never came up again alive out of that water his death was published in the papers accidentally drowned at nice i should never have known the rights or the wrongs of it if mr de lacy hadn't happened to be visiting here soon afterwards did colonel strangway leave no children neither chick nor child do you know if his widow is still living no sir that is the last i ever heard of him or his what about the younger brother i believe he must be dead too though i can't give you chapter and verse he never married didn't mr frederick not to my knowledge he went on board a man-of-war before he was fifteen and at five-and-twenty he was a splendid officer and as fine a young man as you need wish to see 
but he was too fond of the bottle china was the ruin of him some folks said and he got court-martialed out there not long after they sacked that there summer palace there was so much talk about and then he contrived to pass into the mercantile marine which was a come-down for a strangway and for a few years he was one of their finest officers a regular daredevil could sail a ship faster and safer than any man in the service used to race home with the spring pickings of tea when tea wasn't the cheap muck it is now and when there weren't no suez canal to spoil sport but he took to his old games again and he got broke again broke for drunkenness and insubordination and then he went and loafed and drank in jersey where it's my belief he died some years ago you have no positive information about his death i can't say that i have there was one daughter i think yes there was a daughter miss eva i taught her to ride there wasn't a finer horsewoman in dorsetshire but a devil of a temper the real strangway temper i wasn't surprised when i heard she'd married badly i wasn't surprised when i heard she'd run away from her husband did she leave any children no not by him but afterwards do you know if there were children i can't say that i do she was living in boulogne when i last heard of her and somebody told me afterwards that she died there that's vague she may be living still i don't think that's likely it's more than ten years ay it's nearer fifteen since i heard of her death she was not the kind of woman to hide her light under a bushel for a quarter of a century if she were alive i feel sure we should have heard of her at cheriton lord how fond she was of the place and how proud she was of her good looks and her old name and how haughty and overbearing she was with every other young woman that ever came in her way she must have been a remarkably disagreeable young person i take it well not altogether sir she had a taking way when she wasn't in her tantrums and she was very good to the poor people about cheriton they doted upon her she never quarrelled with them it was her father she got on worst those two never could hit it off they were too much alike and at last when she was close upon seventeen and a regular clipper things got so bad that the squire packed off the governess at an hour's warning she was too young and silly to manage such a pupil as miss strangway and it's my belief she sided with her in all her mischief and made things worse he turned her out of doors neck and crop and a week afterwards he took his daughter up to london and handed her over to an english lady who kept a finishing school somewhere abroad at a place called Lausanne. at Lausanne, i think yes that was the name she was to stay there for a year and then she was to have another year's schooling in paris to finish her but she never got to paris didn't miss eva she ran off from Lausanne with a lieutenant in a marching regiment and her father never saw her face again he had no money to give her if she had married ever so well but he took a pride in striking her name out of his will all the same what was her husband's name darcy tom darcy he was an irishman and i've heard he treated her very badly do you know how long it was after her marriage that she left him i only know when i heard they were parted and that was six or seven years after she ran away from Lausanne. how long was that before the squire's death and the sale of the estate nearly ten years i should say that makes it about thirty-four years ago yes that's about it theodore noted down the date in his book he had heard all these things before now loosely and in a disjointed fashion never having been keenly interested in the vicissitudes of the strangways who was the man who took her away from her husband god knows said jasper none of us at cheriton ever heard we fancied he must have been a frenchman for she was heard of afterwards a good many years afterwards at boulogne our old vicar saw her there the year before he died it must have been as late as sixty-four or sixty-five i fancy a wreck he said he wouldn't have recognized her if she hadn't spoken to him and she had to tell him who she was i heard him tell my old master all about it one summer afternoon at the vicarage gate when sir godfrey had driven over to see him yes it must have been as late as sixty-five i believe five years after lord cheriton bought the estate about that do you remember the name of miss strangway's governess of course you do though 
the bailiff rubbed his iron-gray whisker with a puzzled air my memory's got to be like a corn sieve of late years he said but i ought to remember her name she was at cheriton over four years and i only wish i had a guinea for every time i've sat behind her and miss strangway in the pony chaise she was a light-hearted good-tempered young woman but she hadn't bone enough for her work she was enough to miss strangway's weight let me see now what was that young woman's name she was a good-looking girl sandy with a high colour and a freckled skin i ought to remember take a glass of claret mr blake and take your time the name will come back to you have you ever heard of the lady since she left cheriton never she wasn't likely to come back to this part of the world after having been turned out neck and crop as she was what was the name of the man who saw the apple fall newton that was it sarah newton miss strangway used to call her sally i remember that do you know where she came from or what her people were she came from somewhere near london and it's my opinion her father kept a shop but she was very close about her home and her relatives and she was young you say much too young for the place she couldn't have been five-and-twenty when she left and a girl like miss strangway a motherless girl wanted some one older and wiser to keep her in order had the squire's wife been long dead at that time she died before i went to service at cheriton miss eva couldn't have been much above seven years old when she lost her mother theodore asked no more questions not seeing his way to extracting any further information from the bailiff he had been acquainted with most of these facts before or had heard them talked about the handsome daughter who ran away from a foreign school with a penniless subaltern the strangway temper and the pitched battles between the spendthrift father and the motherless unmanageable girl the lifelong breach and then a life of poverty and an untimely death in a strange city only vaguely known yet put forward as a positive and established fact he had heard all this but the old servant's recollections helped him to tabulate his facts helped him too with the name of the governess which might be of some use in enabling him to trace the story of the last of the strangways if there is any ground for juanita's theory i think the man most likely to have done the deed would be at the colonel of lancers supposed to be drowned at nice if i were by any means to discover that the story of the drowning was a mistake and that the colonel is in the land of the living i should be inclined to adopt juanita's view of the murder he encouraged the bailiff to take a second glass of claret and talked over local interests with him for ten minutes or so while his dog-cart was being brought round and then mr blake having withdrawn he went to the drawing-room where juanita was sitting at work by a lamp-lit table and wished her good-night did you find jasper intelligent she asked eagerly very intelligent and did you find out all you wanted from him not quite all he told me very little that i did not know before but there were one or two facts that may be useful good-night nita good-night and good-bye not for long she answered you will spend christmas at home of course yes i shall go home for the christmas week i suppose you will have something to tell me by that time perhaps you will be on the track don't be too sanguine nita i will do my uttermost i am sure you will and you don't know how i trust you how i lean upon you god bless you theodore you are my strong rock i who never had a brother turn to you as a sister might if you can do this thing for me if you can avenge his cruel death if what then juanita he asked paling suddenly and his eyes flaming i shall honour esteem you as i have never done yet and you know i have always looked up to you theodore god bless and prosper you good-night her speech kind as it was fell upon his enthusiasm like ice he was holding both her hands almost crushing them unawares in his vehemence then his grip loosened all at once he bent his head gently kissed those slender hands muttered a husky good-night and hurried from the room End of chapter 10volume one chapter eleven of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven the god of love ah benedicite 
how mighty and how great a lord is he a week later theodore dalbrook was established in chambers on the second floor of number two ferret court temple ferret court is one of the few places in the temple which have not been improved and beautified out of knowledge within the last thirty years the architect and the sanitary engineer have passed by on the other side and have left ferret court to its original shabbiness its ceilings have not been elevated or its windows widened nor has the early english stone front replaced the shabby old brickwork its time has not come the rooms are small and low the queer old closets where generations of lawyers have kept their goods and chattels are dark and redolent of mice the staircases are rotten the heavy old balusters are black with age and the deep old window seats are set in windows of the early georgian era the chambers suited theodore first because they were cheap and next because the sitting-room which was at the back commanded a good view of the river the bedroom was a tolerable size and there was a dressing-room just big enough to hold bath and boots he furnished the rooms comfortably with solid old-fashioned furniture partly consisting of surplus articles sent from the old house in dorchester and partly of his own purchases in london the rooms were arranged with a sober taste which was by no means inartistic and there was just enough bright colouring in the algerian portiere and a few handsome pieces of oriental crockery to relieve the dark tones of old oak and spanish mahogany altogether the chambers had the established look of a nest which was meant to last through wind and weather a shelter in which a man expected to spend a good many years of his life he had another reason for choosing those old rooms in ferret court in preference to chambers in any of those new and commodious houses in the courts that had been rebuilt of late years it was in this house that james dalbrook had begun his legal career it was here on the ground floor that the future lord cheriton had waited for briefs nearly forty years ago and it was here that fame and fortune had first visited him a shining apparition bringing brightness into the shabby old rooms irradiating the gloomy old court with the glory of triumphant ambition hope suddenly realized the consciousness of victory james dalbrook had occupied those dingy chambers fifteen years and long after he became a great man and he had gone from them almost reluctantly to a spacious first floor in king's bench walk he had enjoyed the reputation of a miser at that period of his life he was never known to give a dinner to a friend he lived in a close retirement which his enemies stigmatized as a hole and corner life he was never seen at places of amusement he never played cards or bet upon a race socially he was unpopular theodore had taken all the preliminary steps and had arranged to read with a well-known special pleader he was thoroughly in earnest in his determination to succeed in this new line he wanted to prove to his father that his abandonment of the dorchester office was neither a caprice nor a folly he was even more in earnest in his desire to keep his promise to his cousin juanita almost his first act upon arriving in london had been to go to scotland yard in the hope of finding the detective who had been sent to cheriton and his inquiries there were so far successful that he was able to make an appointment with mr churton for the next day but one he had talked with churton after the adjourned inquest and had heard all that the professional intellect had to offer in the way of opinion at that time but he thought it worth his while to find out if the detective's ideas had taken any new development upon subsequent reflection and also to submit juanita's theory to professional consideration he was not one of those amateurs who think that they are cleverer at a trade than the man who has served a long apprenticeship to it have you thought anything more about the cheriton murder since last july mr churton he asked or has your current work been too engrossing to give you time for thought no sir i've had plenty of other cases to think about but i am not likely to forget such a case as that at cheriton a case in which i was worsted more completely than i have been in anything for the last ten years i've thought about it a good bit i can assure you mr dalbrook and do you see any new light no sir i stick pretty close to my original opinion sir godfrey carmichael was murdered by somebody that bore a grudge against him and there's a woman at the bottom of it why a woman might not a man's hatred be deadly enough to lead to murder not unless he was egged on by a woman or had been jilted by a woman or was jealous of a woman or thought he had a woman's wrongs to avenge is that what your experience teaches you mr churton yes mr dalbrook that is what my experience teaches me and you think it was an enemy of sir godfrey's who fired that shot i do do you think the enemy was a woman the hand that pulled the trigger a woman's hand no i do not a woman couldn't have been about the place without being remarked or got clear off as a man might 
there are the servants could the murderer be one of them i don't think so sir i've taken stock of them all stables lodges everywhere i never met with such a superior set of servants the person at the west lodge is a lady bred and born i should say she gave me a good deal of information about the household i consider her a remarkably intelligent woman and i know she is of my opinion as to the motive of the murder and yet if i tell you that sir godfrey had not an enemy in the world said theodore dwelling on the main point and not particularly interested in what the highly intelligent mrs porter might have said upon the subject i should tell you sir that no man can answer for another man there is something in the lives of most of us that we would rather keep dark i don't believe there was any dark spot in sir godfrey's life but what if there were an enemy of lord cheriton's a man who has been a judge is in a fair way to have made enemies a foe vindictive enough to strike at him through his son-in-law to smite him by destroying his daughter's happiness she is his only child remember and all his hopes and ambitions centre in her well mr dalbrook if there was such a man he would be an out-and-out blackguard yes it would be a refinement of cruelty a satanic hate but such a man might exist remember the murder of lord mayo one of the wisest and most beloved of india's rulers the wretch who killed him had never seen his face till the day of the murder he thought himself unjustly condemned and he killed the man who represented the power which condemned him might not some wrong-headed englishman have the same vindictive feeling against an english judge yes it is possible no doubt my cousin lady carmichael has another theory theodore explained the positions of lord cheriton and the race that preceded him as owners of the soil and juanita's suspicion of some unknown member of the strangway family but the detective rejected this notion as unworthy of professional consideration it is like a young lady to get such an idea into her head he said if the estate had changed hands yesterday well even then i shouldn't suspect the former owners of wanting to murder the purchaser's son-in-law but when you reflect that lord cheriton has been in peaceful possession of the property for more than twenty years the idea isn't worth a moment's thought what put such a fancy into the lady's head do you think mr dalbrook grief she has brooded upon her loss until her sorrow has taken strange shapes she thinks that it is her duty to help in bringing her husband's murderer to justice she has racked her brains to discover the motive of that cruel crime she has conjured up the image of incarnate hatred and she calls that image by the name of strangway i have pledged myself to act upon this idea of hers as if it were an inspiration and the first part of my task will be to find out any surviving member of squire strangway's family he only left three children so the task ought not to be impossible you don't mean sir that you are going to act upon the young lady's theory i do mean it mr churton and i want you to help me or at any rate to give me a lesson how am i to begin he laid his facts before the detective reading over the notes which he had elaborated from jasper blake's reminiscences and from his own recollection of various conversations in which the strangways had figured churton listened attentively nodded or shook his head occasionally and was master of every detail after that one hearing jersey is not a large place if i were following up this inquiry i should go first for the son who is supposed to have died in jersey he said when he had heard all i should follow that line as far as it goes and then i should hunt up the particulars of the colonel's death the gentleman who was drowned at nice if any strangway had a hand in the business it must have been one of those two or the son of one of them but i tell you plainly mr dalbrook that i don't put any faith in that poor lady's notion no not that much said the detective snapping his fingers contemptuously yet it was you yourself who first mooted the idea of a vendetta so it was but i didn't mean a vendetta on such grounds as that an estate changes hands and after twenty years and more the original holders try to murder the son-in-law of the purchaser that won't hold water sir there's not enough human passion in it i've had to study humanity mr dalbrook it's been a part of my profession and perhaps i've studied human nature closer than many a philosopher who sits in his library and writes a book about it now there's no human nature in that notion of lady carmichael's a man may be very savage because his spendthrift father has squandered his estate and he may feel savage with the lucky man who bought and developed that estate and may envy him in his enjoyment of it but he won't nurse his wrath for nearly a quarter of a century and then give expression to his feelings all at once with a revolver 
that isn't human nature how about the exception to every rule might not this be an exceptional case it might of course there's no truer saying than the fact is stranger than fiction but for all that this notion of lady carmichael's is a young lady's notion and it belongs to fiction and not to fact i wouldn't waste my time upon it if i were you mr dalbrook i must keep my promise mr churton i am obliged to you for your plain speaking and i am inclined to agree with you but i have made a promise and i must keep it naturally sir and if in the course of your inquiries i can be of any use to you i shall be very glad to cooperate. i rely on your help remember there is a handsome reward to be earned by you if you can bring about the discovery of the murderer my part in the search will count for nothing i understand sir that's a stimulus no doubt but i hardly wanted it when a case baffles me as this case is done i would work day and night and live on bread and water for a month to get at the rights of it good day you've got my private address and you can wire me any when you're a sussex man mr churton i fancy born in the village of bramber theodore left waterloo the following evening and landed at st helliers on the following morning an hour or so before noon he landed on the island as an absolute stranger and with the vaguest idea of the work that lay before him but with the determination to lose no time in beginning that work he sent his valise to brett's hotel and he walked along the pier to the town and inquired his way to the police office he was not going in quest of information about a member of the criminal classes but the man he was hunting had been a notorious drunkard and it seemed to him that in a small settlement like st helliers such a man would have been likely to attract the attention of the police at some stage of his downward career the first official whom theodore interrogated had never heard of the name of strangway in the island but an elderly inspector appearing presently upon the scene and listening attentively to the conversation made a suggestion you say the gentleman was fond of drink sir and in that case he'd be likely to have his favourite public where they'd know all about him now there are not so many taverns in st helliers where a sea-captain and a broken-down gentleman would care to enjoy himself he wouldn't go to a low place you see and he wouldn't fancy a swell place it would be some house betwixt and between where he'd be looked up a bit and it would be something of a seafaring place you may be sure there ain't so many but what you could look in at em all and ask a few questions and get on the right track i can give you the names of two or three of the likeliest i shall be much obliged said theodore i think it's a capital idea the inspector wrote down the names of three taverns tore the leaf out of his pocket-book and handed it to mr dalbrook if you don't hear of him at one of those i doubt if you'll hear of him anywhere on the island he said those houses are all near the pier and the quays it won't take you long to go from one to the other the rose and crown that's where the english pilots go la belle alliance that's a french house with a table d'hote they've got a very good name for their brandy and it's a great place for broken-down gentlemen you can get a good dinner for half a crown with vin ordinaire included i'll try the belle alliance first said theodore it sounds likely yes i believe it's about the likeliest replied the inspector the belle alliance fronted the quay and stood at the corner of a shabby old street there was a church close by and a dingy old churchyard everything surrounding the belle alliance was shabby and faded and its outlook on the dirty quay and the traffic of ugly wagons and uglier trucks hogsheads and lumber of all kinds was depressing in the extreme but the tavern itself had an air of smartness which an english tavern would hardly have had in the same circumstances the interior was gay with much looking-glass and a good deal of tarnished gilding there were artificial flowers and sham silver vases on the tables and there was a semicircular counter at one end of the restaurant behind which a ponderous divinity still youthful but expansive sat enthroned her sleek black hair elaborately dressed her forehead ornamented with accroche coeur and a cross of jersey diamonds sparkling upon her swan-like throat which was revealed by one of those open collars which are dear to the lower order of french women there was a row of tables in front of the windows which looked towards the quay and there was a long narrow table in the middle of the room laid for the table d'hote dejeuner but as yet the room was empty save for one young man and woman of the tourist order who were whispering and tittering over a café complet at one of the small tables furthest from the buffet theodore went straight to the front of the buffet and saluted the lady enthroned there madame speaks english no doubt oh yes but a little i am live long in jersey 
where is more english as french peoples after this sample speech it seemed to him that he might get on better with the lady in her native tongue so he asked her for a cup of coffee in her own language and stood at the counter while he drank it and talked to her of indifferent matters she nothing loath you have lived a long time in jersey he said does that mean a long time in this house except one year i have lived in this house all the time nine years i was only nineteen when i undertook the position of dame du comptoir i could not have undertaken such a responsibility with a stranger but the proprietor is my uncle and he knew how to be indulgent to my youth and inexperience and then a handsome face is always an attraction you must have brought him good fortune madame he is kind enough to say so he found it difficult to dispense with my services while i was absent though he had a person from london who had been much admired at the crystal palace and you madame was it a feminine caprice the desire for change which made you abandon your uncle during that time i left him when i married replied the lady with a profound sigh i returned to him a heart-broken widow pray forgive me for having recalled the memory of your grief i am a stranger in this place and i am here on a somewhat delicate mission my first visit is to this house because i knew i should find intelligence and sympathy here rather than among my own countrymen i am fortunate in meeting with a lady who has occupied an important position at st helliers for so long a period i have strong reasons for wishing to discover the history of a gentleman who came to the island some years ago i do not know how many after having been unfortunate in the world he was a naval man my poor husband was a naval man sighed the dame du comptoir a pilot no doubt thought theodore theodore's manner which was even more flattering than his words had made a favourable impression and the lady was disposed to be confidential she glanced at the clock and was glad to see that it was only twenty minutes past twelve there was time for a little further conversation with this handsome well-bred englishman before the habitue of the belle alliance came trooping in for the half-past twelve o'clock table d'hote already the atmosphere was odorous with fried sole and ragout de mouton the gentleman of whom i am in quest is reported to have died on the island he continued but this is very likely to have been a false report and it is quite possible that captain strangway may still captain strangway echoed the woman with an agitated air yes i see you know all about him you can help me to find him know him cried the woman i should think i did know him to my bitter cost captain strangway was my husband good heavens he was my husband the people will be here in a few minutes if monsieur will do me the honour to step into my sitting-room we can talk without interruption End of chapter eleven volume one chapter twelve of the day will come by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the comfort is you shall be called to no more payments fear no more tavern bills the dame du comptoir beckoned a waiter and delegated some portion of her supreme authority to him for the next quarter of an hour she constituted as it were a regency and gave her subordinate command over her wine and liqueur bottles her fin champagne bass and guinness and then she ushered theodore dalbrook into a very small sitting-room at the back of the counter so small indeed that a large looking-glass a porcelain stove two armchairs and one little table left hardly standing-room theodore followed with a sense of bewilderment he had told himself that the island of jersey was a world so small that he could not have much difficulty in tracing any man who had lived and died there within the last ten years but accident had been kinder to him than he had hoped the lady seated herself in one of the ruby velvet armchairs and motioned him to the other you have given me a shock monsieur she said my friends in the island know that my marriage was unfortunate and they never mention my husband he is forgotten as if he had never been i sometimes fancy that year of my life was only a troubled dream even my name is unchanged i was called mademoiselle coralie before i married i am called madame coralie now i am sorry to have caused you painful emotion madame but it is most important to me to trace the history of your husband's later years and i deem myself very fortunate in having found you is it about a property a fortune left him perhaps exclaimed coralie with sudden animation her fine eyes lighting up with hope alas no 
fortune had nothing in reserve for your unlucky husband unlucky indeed but not so unlucky as i was in giving my heart to him i knew that he was a drunkard i knew that he had been turned out of the navy and out of the mercantile marine on account of that dreadful vice but he he was very fond of me poor fellow and he swore that he would never touch a glass of brandy again as long as he lived if i would consent to marry him he did turn over a new leaf for a time and kept himself sober and steady and would hang over that counter for a whole evening talking to me and taking nothing but black coffee i thought i could reform him i thought it would be a grand thing to reform a man like that a gentleman bred and born a man whose father had been a great landowner and whose family name was one of the oldest in england he was a gentleman in all his ways he never forgot himself even when he has been drinking he was a gentleman to the last such a fine-looking man too while he was courting me and kept himself steady he got back his good looks he looked ten years younger and i was very proud of him the day we were married he had taken a house for me a nice little house on the hill near the jesuits college with a pretty little garden and i had furnished the house out of my savings i had saved a goodish bit since i came to jersey for my uncle is a generous man and my situation here is a good one i had over two hundred pounds in hand after i paid for the furniture these chairs were in my drawing-room and he hadn't much more than the clothes he stood upright in poor fellow but i wouldn't have minded that if he had only kept himself steady i was prepared to keep him he was too much of a gentleman to be able to work except in his profession and that was gone from him for ever so i knew it was incumbent on me to work for both and i thought that by letting our drawing-room floor in the season and by doing a little millinery all the year round i'm a good milliner monsieur i thought i could manage to keep a comfortable home without touching my two hundred pounds in the savings bank you were a brave unselfish girl to think so ah sir we are not selfish when we love i was very fond of him poor fellow i had begun with pitying him and then he was a thoroughbred gentleman he was vieille roche monsieur and i have always admired the noblesse i am no republican moi and he had such winning ways when he was sober and he was not stupid as other men are when he was drunk only more brilliant la tête montée hélas comme il pitiait d'esprit but it was his brain that he was burning that was the fuel that made the light but how is it you interest yourself in him monsieur she asked suddenly fixing him with her sharp black eyes you say it is not about property you must have a motive all the same i have a motive but my interest is not personal i am acting for someone who now owns the strangway estate and who wishes to know what has become of the old family what can it matter to any one asked madame coralie suspiciously they had lost all their money of the land that had been theirs not an acre was left what business is it of any one's what became of them when they were driven from their birthplace oh how my poor frederick hated the race that had possessed itself of his estate there was nothing too bad for them when he was excited he would rave about them awfully a beggarly lawyer a black-hearted scoundrel that is what he would call lord lord sherrington when he had been drinking theodore's brow grew thoughtful how strange this seemed almost like a confirmation of juanita's superstitious horror of the banished race perhaps it was not unnatural that an unlucky spendthrift ruined disgraced should hate the favourite of fortune who had ousted him but not with a hate capable of murder murder in cold blood the murder of a man who had never injured him even indirectly your husband has been dead some years i conclude he said presently three years and a half on the tent of last month and you had a troublesome time with him i fear trouble seems a light word for what i went through it was like living in hell there is no other word the hell which a madman can make of all around him for a few weeks we went on quietly he seemed contented and i was very happy thinking i had cured him i watched him as a cat watches a mouse for fear he should go wrong again he never went out without me and at home i did all that a woman can do to make much of the man she loves studying him in everything surrounding him with every little luxury i could afford cooking dainty little meals for him petting him as if he had been an idolized child he seemed grateful for the first few weeks and almost happy then i saw he was beginning to mope a little 
he got low-spirited and would sit over the fire and brood it was cutting march weather and would moan over his blighted life and his own folly if i had to begin over again he would say ah it would be different cora it would be all different he was not unkind to you no he was never unkind never to the last when he died raving mad with delirium tremens he was always kind it was seeing his madness and his ruin that made my trouble he was violent sometimes and threatened to kill me but that was only when he did not know me i watched him moping for a week or so and then one day i was so unhappy at seeing him fret that i thought i would do anything to cheer him i fancied he missed the company in this house and the cards and dominoes and billiards for before we were married he used to dine at the table d'hote two or three times a week and used to be in the cafe or in the billiard room every night how did he manage to live without a profession and without ostensible means madame shrugged her shoulders god knows i think he used to write to his old friends his brother officers in the navy or the merchant service and he got a little from one and a little from another he would borrow of any one and there was a small legacy from his mother's sister which fell into him soon after he came to jersey that was all gone before i married him he hadn't a penny after he'd paid the marriage fees well monsieur seeing him so downhearted i proposed that he should go down to the belle alliance and have a game at billiards and see his old friends you needn't take any money i said my uncle will treat you hospitably he seemed pleased at the idea and he promised to be home early but just as he was leaving the house he turned back and said there was a little bill of thirty shillings he owed to a bootmaker in the street round the corner and he didn't like to pass the man's shop without paying would i let him have the money it was the first money he'd asked me for since we were married and i hadn't the heart to say no so i went to my little cash-box and took out three half-sovereigns i told him that the money meant a week's housekeeping i give you nice little dinners don't i fred i said but you've no idea how economical i am he laughed and he kissed me and said he hated economy and wished he had a fortune for my sake and he went down the street whistling well sir perhaps you can guess what happened he came home at three o'clock next morning mad with drink and then i knew he was not to be cured and went on trying all the same though till the last and i lived the life of a soul in torment i was fond of him to the last and saw him killing himself inch by inch and saw him die a dreadful death one year and three days after our wedding day he spent every penny i had in the world and my uncle helped us when that was gone and i came back to this house after his funeral a broken-hearted woman all my furniture which i'd worked for was sold to pay the rent and the doctors and the undertaker i just saved the furniture in this room and that is all that is left of four hundred and seventy pounds and of my married life you were indeed the victim of a generous and confiding heart i was fond of him to the last monsieur and i forgave him all my sufferings but let no woman ever marry a drunkard with the hope of reforming him were you quite alone in your martyrdom had your husband no relatives left to help him on his dying bed not one he told me he was the last of his race he must have had distant relations i suppose but his elder brother was dead and his sister you are sure his brother was dead yes he fell into the water at nice on a dark evening when he was going on board the steamer for corsica i have got the paper with the account of his death will you show me that paper and any other documents relating to your husband's family i know i have no right to ask such a favour but all i can say is that i shall be very grateful if he will so far oblige me the table d'hote was in full swing in the adjoining room as testified by the clattering of plates and the jingle of knives and forks and a subdued murmur as of a good many confidential conversations carried on simultaneously you want to see my poor fred's private papers said the widow meditatively that's a good deal to ask not that there are any secrets in them that can hurt anybody above ground the colonel is dead and his sister my husband was the last but i can't understand why anybody should want to pry into a dead man's papers unless there's property hanging to them she looked at theodore suspiciously as if she could not divest herself of the idea of a fortune having turned up somehow unexpectedly a fortune to which her dead husband was entitled there is no property i assure you 
it is a question of sentiment not of money you're a lawyer i suppose said coralie still suspiciously she supposed that it was only lawyers who went about prying into the affairs of the dead i am a lawyer but the business which brings me to jersey is not law business well i don't see any harm coming to me through your seeing my husband's papers there's not many to see a few letters from the colonel and two or three from a lawyer about the legacy and a dozen or so from old friends refusing or sending him money you've spoken kindly to me and i felt that you sympathized with me though you're a stranger so well you may see his letters though it hurts me to touch anything that belonged to him le pauvre homme she took a bunch of keys from her pocket unlocked the little secretaire and from one of the drawers produced a bundle of old letters and cuttings from newspapers which she handed to theodore dalbrook and then seated herself opposite to him planted her elbows on the table and watched him while he read keenly on the alert for any revelation of his purpose which might escape him in the course of his reading she had not altogether relinquished that idea of an inheritance or legacy property of some kind involved in this endeavour to trace a dead man's history the explanation which theodore had given had not convinced her he had confessed himself a lawyer and that was in itself enough to make her doubt him the cuttings from old newspaper belonged to the days when frederick strangway had commanded a warship to the days when he fought in the chinese war some of them recorded the honour he had won for himself at different stages of his career and it was only natural that these should have been carefully preserved by him in all his wanderings but there were other cuttings the report of the court-martial that broke him the trial in which he stood accused of having risked the loss of his ship with all hands aboard by his dissolute habits a shameful and a painful story this record of his folly had been kept by that strange perversity of the human mind which makes a man secrete and treasure documents which must wring his heart and bow his head with shame every time he looks at them there were other extracts of a like shameful kind reports of street rows two cases of drunken assault in san francisco one of a fight in sydney harbour he had kept them all as if they had been words of praise and honour the letters were most of them trivial letters from brother officers of the past very sorry to hear of your embarrassments regret inability to do more than the enclosed small check the numerous claims upon my purse render it impossible for me to grant the loan requested the usual variations upon the old tune in which a heavily taxed pater familias fences with the appeal of an unlucky acquaintance they were such letters as are left by the portmanteau full among the effects of the man for whom the world has been too hard theodore put aside all this correspondence after a brief glance and there remained only four letters in the same strong resolute hand the hand of reginald strangway the first in date was written on army and navy club paper and was addressed to captain strangway r n h m s cobra hong kong my dear fred i have been sorry to leave your letters so long unanswered but i am bothered about a great many things my wife has been out of health for nearly a year the doctors fear her chest is affected and tell me i ought to get her away from england before the winter as things have been going very badly with me for a long time i shall not be sorry to cut this beastly town where the men who have made their money god knows how are now upon the crest of the wave and by their reckless expenditure have made it impossible for a man of small means to live in london if he wants to live like a gentleman everything is twice as dear as it used to be when i was a subaltern my wife and i are pigging in two rooms on a second floor in german street i live at my club and she lives on her relatives so that we don't often have to sit down to a lodging-house dinner of burnt soles and greasy chops but the whole business is wretched she has to go to parties in a four-wheel cab and i can hardly afford the risk of a rubber so i shall be uncommonly glad to cut it all and settle in some out-of-the-way place where we can live cheap and where the climate will suit millicent my first idea was algiers but things are still rather unsettled there as you know lambton of the guards has been shooting in corsica lately and came home with a glowing account of the climate and the cheapness of the inns which are ruggish but clean and fairly comfortable so i have determined on corsica we shall be within a day's sail of nice so not utterly out of reach of civilization and we can live there how we like without entertaining a mortal or having to buy new clothes millicent who is fond of novelty is in love with the notion and dangerfield has behaved very well to her promising her an extra hundred a year if we will live quietly and keep out of debt which considering he is as poor as job is not so bad 
as for my creditors they are pretty quiet since i got aunt bell's legacy part of which i divided among em as a sop to cerberus they'll have to be still quieter when i'm settled in corsica of course you have heard of that wretched woman's kicking over the traces altogether at last god knows what will become of her i believe she had been carrying on rather badly for some time before tom found out anything you know what an ass he is however he got hold of a letter one evening met the postman at the door and took her letters along with his own and didn't like the look of one and opened it and then there was an infernal row and she just put on her bonnet and shawl walked out of the house and called a cab and drove off he followed in another cab but it was a foggy night and he lost her before she'd gone far they were in lodgings in essex street and it isn't easy for one cab to chase another on a foggy evening she never went back to him and he went all over london denouncing her naming first one man and then another but without any definite idea as to who the real man was the letter was only a couple of sentences in italian which tom knew only by sight but he could see it was an appointment at a theatre for the theatre and hour were named she snatched the letter out of his hand while they were quarrelling he told me and chucked it into the fire so he hasn't even the man's handwriting as evidence against him it was a hand he had never seen before he says however if he wants to find her no doubt he can do so if he takes the trouble i am sorry that she should disgrace her family and of course my wife feels the scandal uncommonly hard upon her i can't say that i feel any pity for tom darcy she had led a wretched life with him ever since he sold out and i don't much wonder at her being deuce glad to leave him as it's tom's business to shoot her lover and not mine i shan't mix myself up in the affair and as for her well she has made her bed there was more in the letter but the rest was of no interest to theodore the letter was dated january third eighteen fifty one three of the remaining letters were from corsica and contained nothing of any significance a fourth was written at monte carlo in answer to an appeal for money and the date was twelve years later than the first it was a gloomy letter the letter of a ruined man who had drunk the cup of disappointment to the dregs to ask me for help seems like a ghastly joke on your part whatever your troubles may be i fancy my lookout is darker than yours my wife and i have vegetated on that accursed island for just a dozen years it seems like a lifetime to look back upon we just had enough to live upon while my father was alive for as bad as things were at cheriton he contrived to send me something now that he is gone and the estate has been sold by the mortgagees there is nothing left for me and we have been living for the last two years upon the pittance my poor milly gets from her father whatever your cares may be you don't know what it is to have a sick wife whose condition requires every luxury and indulgence and to have barely enough for bread and cheese if you were to see the house we live in the tiled floors and the dilapidated furniture and the windows that won't shut and the shutters that won't keep too and our two corsican servants who look like a brace of savages though they are good creatures in the main you would be the last man to howl about your own troubles to me i have been here a month and with my usual diabolical luck i am going home to-morrow though perhaps i should be wiser if i went up into the hills behind monaco and put a bullet through my brains millicent would be no worse off god help her for she is entirely dependent on her father and i am only an incubus but she might think herself worse off poor soul so i suppose i had better go home what am i thinking about i can't afford to take refuge in the suicide's haven my life is insured in the imperial for three thousand pounds and poor old dangerfield has been paying the premium ever since i began to go to the bad financially it would be too hard upon him if i shot myself this was the last letter and it was endorsed by the brother's hand reginald's last letter i read in the times newspapers of his being drowned at nice ten days afterwards theodore made a note of the dates of these letters and the name of the insurance office provided with these data it would be easy for him to verify the fact of colonel strangway's death and thus bring the history of the two sons of old squire strangway to its dismal close in dust and darkness and thus would be answered juanita's strange suspicion of the house of strangway answered with an unanswerable answer who can argue with death is not that at least the end of all things the road that leads no whither there remained for him only the task of tracing the erring daughter to her last resting-place 
this would doubtless be more difficult as a runaway wife living under a false name and in all probability going from place to place was likely to have left but faint and uncertain indications of her existence but the first part of his task had been almost too easy he felt that he could take no credit for what he had done could expect no gratitude from juanita he thanked mrs strangway alias madame coralie for her politeness and asked to be allowed to offer her a ten-pound note as a trifling acknowledgment of the favour she had done him she promptly accepted this offering and was only the more convinced that there was property involved in the lawyer's researches if there is anything to come to me from any of his relations i hope nobody will try to keep me out of it she said i hope his friends will remember that i gave him my last shilling and nursed him when there wasn't many would have stayed in the room with him theodore reiterated his assurance that no question of money or inheritance was involved in his mission to the island and then bade the captain's widow a respectful adieu and threaded his way through the avenue of tables to the door and out of the garlic charged atmosphere into the fresh autumnal air he stayed one night in jersey and left at eleven o'clock the next morning on board the fanny and slept in his chambers in ferret court after having written a long letter to juanita with a full account of all that he had learned from the lips of the widow and from the letters of the dead i do not surrender my hope of finding the murderer he wrote finally but you must now agree with me that i must look elsewhere than among the remnants of the strangway race they can prove an unanswerable alibi the grave he went to the office of the imperial next morning saw the secretary and ascertained that the amount of the policy upon colonel strangway's life had been paid to lady melissa strangway his widow in april eighteen sixty three after the directors had received indisputable evidence of his death i remember the case perfectly said the secretary the circumstances were peculiar and there was a suspicion of suicide as the man had just left monte carlo and was known to have lost his last napoleon after a most extraordinary run of luck there was some idea of disputing the claim but if he did make away with himself he had contrived to do it so cleverly that it would have been uncommonly difficult to prove that his death was not an accident more particularly as lord dangerfield brought an action against the steamboat company for wilful negligence in regard to their gangway and deficient lighting the policy was an old one too so it was decided not to litigate there could be no doubt as to the identity of the man who was drowned at nice i conclude no the question of identity was carefully gone into lord dangerfield happened to be wintering at cannes that year and he heard of his son-in-law's death in time to go over and identify the body before it was coffined you know how quickly burial follows death in that part of the world and there would have been no possibility of the widow getting over from a jacchio before the funeral we had lord dangerfield's declaration that the body he saw at nice was the body of colonel strangway and we paid the three thousand pounds on that evidence we have never had any reason to suspect error or foul play End of chapter twelve